Let me just say this. I'm part of an organization called ARC, which is the Association of Related Churches. One of the largest church planning organizations in the world. And um, I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago. And this is referring to, because California technically isn't open. And so we're getting all of the analytics and data from Florida, Georgia, Alabama, that now have been open pastor for eight months, seven months. And Oklahoma, the average church, and these are not just the regular churches, these are what they would call mega churches like your guys's. The average church attendance is no more than 39%. That means 60, 70% are still at home. And I looked at your pastor when I came out here. And I said, I think they need to send all the statisticians over here and try to figure out what God's doing over here. Because this is like 200%. And I, I, felt, I felt led to say that because I think in some degree, one of, the, one of the worst things you can do is treat this place common. It's almost like you hear your pastor and you hear him every week and he's saying, man, God's doing amazing things. And then sometimes you sit back and you go, by whose standards? And yet what he said up here tonight was he, you know, he, I don't know if you caught it, but he says, I don't think there is a church in America. And he's absolutely right. Because, because at the end of the day, when I look around, it's like 200% in this place. It's amazing. And, you know, before we get in the word and, and um, you know, I will say that the one thing about the pandemic, when it comes to anything, whether it's church or whether it's business, even if it's family, if this pandemic has revealed anything, it's revealed who leaders are. Leadership thrives on the backdrop of pandemics and chaos. And I say that because if you've ever questioned your pastor's leadership, it can literally shut the mouth of critics right now. Because what you have, who you are becoming, where you are going is a direct result that your pastors hear the voice of the Spirit of God. And before we're seated, I know we've given Jesus some jumps, we've given Jesus some claps, but we ought to honor the man and the woman of God, the prophet of God of this house. We love you. Wow, look what you've done. Come on. Come on, you ought to give your pastor a bigger shout right now. Love you. You know, you can never talk to him for five minutes. He'll call me, say, we'll talk on the phone. He say, do you have a couple of minutes? And I know it's never going to be a couple of minutes. Because at the end of the day, he's so full. And we're in his office right before church. And I say something. Next thing you know, he pulls out the Bible. <laughs> Let me show you what the Bible, what God's saying right now. And I'm man of God man of God woman of God but well, we know behind every great man come on is a greater woman we ought to love the first lady of the house right come on can you give your first lady a big round of applause as well I'm so glad and I'm so glad and honored to have my wife here been together 19 years 
I've been married 19 years, together 29 years. And uh, she is, she is my lady and my only lady. And I love her. She's here. Why don't you give her, give her a big round of applause too, right? Amen. All right. Romans chapter 7. Remain standing and I'll sit you down. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Beginning in verse 15. Paul's writing. And he says, I'm a mystery to myself. For I want to do what is right. But I end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. I want to speak tonight a message I've entitled, Repair My Gates. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the spirit of revelation. Give our minds illumination that we would experience transformation. God, I pray you give us a mind to perceive and a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we will never be the same. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say... Amen. Amen. You may be seated now in the presence of the Lord. I want to welcome all of you that are watching online, literally around the world. God bless you. We feel you. There's no doubt about it that we are living in one of the greatest moments of history. When the world sees chaos, the world sees fear. The world sees pain. It is when God is at his best. You see, at the end of the day, you and I, literally almost 11 months ago, the world shut down. Buildings closed. And yet it was as if God was orchestrating something behind the scenes. Though COVID came, God was doing something behind the scenes. And what God did was that he caused an interruption. And he says, for the very first time since history's recorded the church back until Pentecost that the walls of the church were closed God said I'm gonna I'm gonna allow the buildings to close down because I'm going to have to deal once again with my church And all of a sudden you saw believers who were running around in church, hop, skipping and dancing, want nothing to do with God right now. You got folks that were being discipled in disciple classes and now you don't even know where to find them. And it was almost as if God was trying to lift the blanket off the church so that nobody can hide behind their religion anymore. Not reveal to the world, but reveal to you and I. Who is the church? What is church all about? Altar calls. Deliverance. Lives being changed. And it was almost as if pre-pandemic people were coming to church for themselves. Give me what I need today. Touch my life. God, heal me. And it was almost as if we got so consumed with us that in some degree we forgot really why God even saved you in the first place. Let me help you out here. God didn't save you because you were lost. Because how can you be lost from a God who's omnipresent everywhere at the same time? It's like when God showed up 
in the garden and he asked Adam, where are you? It's not as if God didn't know where he was. Because it's impossible to play hide and go seek with God when he is omnipresent everywhere at the same time and he's omniscient, he's all knowing. So when God asked Adam, where are you? It's not that he didn't know where Adam's physical presence was. It was the first time that God couldn't see his reflection. And so I believe that the reason why God allowed the church walls to shut down because when God was seeing the church from heaven, he could not see his reflection anymore. He said, I got a church covered up with all kinds of stuff right now. I, they're covered up with manipulation. They're covered up with procrastination. They got the spirit of myself. Gimme, 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 because my name is Jimmy. They just come to church because they just want their stuff. And then almost as if we forget that I wasn't, I wasn't saved because I was lost. I was not even really saved because I was broken. Because if that was the case, then our God would be a reactive God. You're lost, I gotta react to that. You're broken, I gotta react to that. You're sick, I gotta react to that. But God's not a reactionary God. See, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter one that while you were in your mother's womb, I formed you. I gave you a name. I called you to be a prophet to the nations. Your sins didn't change God's mind on your, of your purpose. So he didn't save you just because you were lost. He didn't save you just because you were broken. He saved you that even before you took your first breath, he knew he needs you. Can I go deep today? Can I teach? I asked him to give me a headset so I can teach. Well, Pastor Obed, what are you talking about? God needs me. God can do whatever he wants to do. Absolutely. But from the beginning, God said, I'm going to do it through man. When you see all of this taking place, cities getting burnt down, government lying to people, Leaders taking advantage. The church doesn't know which side to be on. Am I on the right or am I on the left? Do I serve a donkey or do I serve an elephant? When Joshua asked the question, whose side are you? The angel of the Lord said, I'm on no one's side. Because at the end of the day, the church is never designed to be on a side. They're designed to take over in Jesus' name. We don't serve an elephant and we don't serve a donkey. We serve a dove. His name is the Holy Spirit. And so all of a sudden, there's, there's all this chaos. And you start questioning yourself. This is what Paul was going through. He says, why do I do the things I hate to do, yet I find myself doing them? Could it be that the believers today on the one end have so much reliability on God and yet on the other end have no responsibility for themselves. So it's like, God, I need you. God, I need a miracle. And then God 
God saying, I can do that. But this time around, I need the church to also be responsible. Come on, I'm going to go there. It's like, God, I need a financial miracle. And God says, I can do that. But I also need you to be responsible and tithe. Oh, y'all don't want to hear this right now, right? God, can you get me out of this relationship because it's driving me crazy? And God says, I could do that. But responsibility says, I've gone down that road before and I should have never gone back to that road again. That's called responsibility. You see, we cannot see God anymore as our bailout. You're too, as your pastor said, mature for that now. So Nehemiah, he's in a very similar situation, just like us. The world is in chaos. The gates have burnt down. The city is desperate. And you would think that God would have used another man in that time, like Ezra, who was a priest. Or he would have probably used Malachi in that time that was a prophet. To rebuild and restore. I'm gonna use a priest. I'm going to use a prophet. God used neither. He says, I'm going to speak to a man named Nehemiah, who's a layman. If you think that what God's about to rebuild out of the ashes of this pandemic called his church is solely going to be on a prophet, you're wrong. Or solely on a priest, you're wrong. God is looking for laymen. People like you and I. People like you sitting in that seat. As much as God's going to use your pastor, he's going to use him. As much as God's going to use a priest, he'll use a priest. As much as he's going to use a prophet, he'll use a prophet. But who's going to rebuild a city? Are the laymen that the Nehemiahs of this day and God has chosen you in Jesus' name. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. Because we always refer back to Nehemiah when it comes to the accolades of what he did. He rebuilt these walls in 52 days. He was incredible. He was such a phenomenal leader. But Nehemiah was you. Nehemiah was in the comfort of the king. But he didn't start there. Nehemiah decided one day, I'm going to live with excellence. He didn't sit there and say, when I get there, I'm going to live in excellence. He says, I'm going to live in excellence now. Because excellence is a choice. And once you make the choice of living with excellence, then all of a sudden, you will take on the actions of discipline. And once you take on the actions of discipline because you've taken the choice of living by excellence, now all of a sudden, you will take on the discipleship and that's a mindset. 
And so because now I have discipleship and it's a mindset because I have discipline that started with action, but it really started with the choice by deciding I'm going to live by excellence. That's when God raises you up as a leader and that becomes your lifestyle. So I'll never get the lifestyle of leadership until I get the until I get the disciplines, which is my mindset that comes with my dedication by my action. But it all begins with the choice called excellence. And you think, well, when I get over here, I'm going to live by excellence. When I get over, when I get out, and God says, no, excellence is a choice right now. This was Nehemiah. Nehemiah was living in the palace of a king. He was a cupbearer. And all of a sudden, Nehemiah gets a burden. Burdens is what births vision. You will never leave the comfort of the king to go to broken communities unless you first get a burden. You see, Nehemiah went to the king and he says, I have to go back to my community. I've been in your presence. I've enjoyed it for so long. You've given me every meal. I've been able to be at your feet. Once a month, I joined you at the table. Man, I would hear your music and dance around. I would see other fellow members of this palace in fellowship with them. Am I, am, I, am, I, am, I, am I making sense right now? Because that was the church pre-pandemic. We loved being in the presence of the king. We loved when the king would bring us hot meals like the bread of the word and the meat of the word. We love dancing in the presence of the king with our fellow members of the palace. And yet the whole time, there are cities being burnt up and gates that are being ruined. And God's saying, when is the church going to get a burden? And so God was like, since you haven't come to me, I'll just close the palace down for some time. And this is when you and I started to realize, oh man, it's Sunday and we can't go to church. We can't go to a building. And then all of a sudden you've been compelled. Come on, let's go out and let's do some outreach. Come on, let's go help some people. Come on, let's be a blessing to somebody. And God says, I had to shut the palace down for a little bit so that you can get a glimpse of where you were at one time because you've been enjoying too much of my palace. What good is it to be so blessed and not have no burden? Man, we're getting blessed in church. You get to come here and you've been able to come here now for three nights. Blessed. But if you're leaving tonight with just another blessing on a Friday night and you don't have a burden for your neighbor, these walls have been burnt down and gates are going, friends, then what's the point? Why would God want to bless you? Nehemiah. He had an understanding theologically that I am rescued 
by a rescuer only to go out and rescue people. He, he enjoyed the palace. He enjoyed being in the presence of the king. But he got a burden. Because he understood theologically. I was rescued. By the rescuer. Only to go back and rescue people. No, no, no. I've been enjoying the palace when where I grew up, I got wind that the cities have been burnt down and the gates are burnt and the walls are down. But I'm in this position because theologically, I've been rescued by the rescuer only to go back and rescue. So if you understand theologically that you've been rescued by the rescuer to only go back and rescue others, that's what Nehemiah did. So not only did Nehemiah understand it theologically, but Nehemiah also understood it providentially. That providentially, God knew the wares of the moment that I am living in right now. I could have been with my family over here in whom the gates were burnt down and the walls came falling down, but I was rescued over here by the rescuer only to go back and rescue. Yet providentially, he knows my whereabouts and where I am actually supposed to be. Come on. Pastor, here's, here's what I've understood. That most church people know somewhat of their life theologically. But you could hear it in their voices that they don't understand their lives providentially. Because we say things like, I can't believe this is happening. Why is the world going like this right now? All this pandemic stuff. Oh, I just can't wait till it's all over with. But if you understood your life providentially, you would know I was actually born for this moment. That there is no other moment that's in history that I was born for this moment. Listen, you weren't born to help people in the flood or you would have been Noah. You weren't born to be in the wilderness like Moses. You would have been Moses. But you were born for 2021 right now. And the same way God wants to use them, he wants to use you. I know my life. I, 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 I know my life theologically. I know, I know that I've been rescued by the rescuer only to go and rescue. But I also know my life providentially. That there is no other moment in history than the moment I am living in right now. 
that I have been adequately and supernaturally prepared for everything that God has done inside of me to come outside of me. I'm be, I've been waiting for such a time like this. And that's why you have a leader that understands he's living in a providential moment right now. He knows I can't waste another day because at the end of the day, there's people that I know I'm supposed to rescue because this is my assignment now. I get it. I get my life theologically. I know that I've been rescued to rescue. And I know there's going to be no other time in history that I will shine the way I'm supposed to now. God needed Moses for that time. God needed Elijah for that time. God, he needed David for that Goliath. God needed Samson for that time. God, he needed Isaiah to open up the canvas of life and see thousands of years later to write about it and bring it back to that moment. He needed him at that time. And God knew that there would be a disease, a virus, that will sweep across the world. And God is looking at the church today and he says, I need the church to rise up for such a time as this because you were born for this moment. I know my life theologically I know my life now providentially but I also need to know my life purposefully that I've been equipped and divinely instructed to go do my part Because there is somebody out there that's assigned to you that will never come into this place until you show up at their place. And you will never show up to their place to bring them into this place until you know your life theologically, that I've been rescued to rescue so I could be a rescuer, that I know my life providentially, that I'm born for this moment and for such a time as this, and now I know my life purposely, which means I've been given a divine assignment. Theologically, providentially, purposefully. And during all of these backdrops of chaos, the flood, the plagues, the wilderness, God was trying to do one thing and it was always for his people. This pandemic wasn't for you. 
but it was supposed to awaken you. Just like the wilderness awakened Moses to go back to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Just like, just like all of the sin that awakened something in Noah to build an ark. Just like all of the false gods awakened something in Elijah to confront them. Every one of these pandemics was never meant for them, but it was meant to awaken them. And Nehemiah, not a priest, not a prophet, but a layman, had a look at his life. God chose him because Nehemiah had the right habits. He prayed. He spent time with the king. He feasted from the meals of the palace. And when it was all done, Not for the people in the palace, but for the peoples whose gates have been burnt down and whose walls came falling down. Reliability, responsibility. God, I need you. Reliability. Obed, I need you. Responsibility. The way Family World Outreach Church, we need you. And God's saying, the way World Outreach Church, I need you. But this time around, it cannot be all reliability. It also has to be your part, responsibility. And so when you're crying out and you're saying, God, do something in my city, God says, I can. Reliability. But I, before you were born, decided to use you. Responsibility. So it's not until the church on one end has reliability. We're gonna come to the king. We're gonna worship, we're gonna dance, we're gonna worship, we're gonna dance, we're gonna worship. Reliability. But then, when pastor says, I'll see you next week, that blessing turns to a burden. And now all of a sudden, it's my responsibility to go to the place that God's calling me to bring families from the streets to the house. Why? Because I am a Nehemiah. Listen. Listen. You there? Can you hear me? Hello. There you go. Three things and then I'm going to close. The first thing 
that Nehemiah had to do was that Nehemiah had to reboot personally. The word reboot is a computer term, which means that it started by getting stuck. And so you kept on pressing the button. And the reason why it got stuck was because it got confused. So because you kept on pressing the button, it got confused about its confusion. <laughs> what this pandemic did is that when it hit, and they said it's only gonna last two weeks, We were confused, so we kept on. And the confusion was confused from the first confusion. And so what does a computer have to do? It has to reboot. The children of Israel were confused. So they kept on. And so Nehemiah knew, I couldn't just come and rescue first. I had to reboot. And reboot means I close everything up but it's still on. So what did God have to do? I'm gonna close everything down. But the church was still open. Because the church was confused. And it's confusion was even confused. This is why you've come to church. Shandai Tama Bowtie. On Sunday. Go get in a bad relationship on Tuesday. Confusion. And then you would and all of a sudden your confusion would be confused. So God said, I gotta reboot you. It was like Paul, why do I do the things I hate to do? Yet I find myself doing them. Reboot. So you have to reboot yourself personally. The second thing that God did with Nehemiah, he regathered them passionately. He rebooted them personally, regathered them passionately. Because the book of Nehemiah says, and the people were scattered. When it closed, the people were scattered. And God said, when they come back, they won't come back complacent, but they will come back passionate. Your pastor leaned over to me. He says, I, I, I believe you can go ahead. You can make me sound holy. <laughs> he said, I believe this is our largest, like, revival. And it didn't shock me. 
because the ones prior it didn't shock me with all these people up here it didn't shock me because you've been rebooted personally regathered passionately and then the third thing that Nehemiah did and this is where I want to park for a moment because this is when the anointing is about to hit they rebuilt purposefully let us reboot personally regather passionately so that we can rebuild purposefully let me let me reboot personally let me regather passionately and then let me rebuild purposefully why because I know my life theologically I was rescued from the rescuer only to go out and rescue I know my life providentially I was never supposed to be alive except only on this day and I am absolutely born for this moment and this is going to be the moment that I will be my best at and because I know my life theologically I understand my life providentially therefore I can go live my life purposefully and what did God have to do? He had to reboot me personally so he can regather us passionately so that together we can rebuild purposefully now here it is here's your word here's your word I asked my assistant this morning can you call them and tell them I want a headset now that don't that may not mean something to you but I've been doing this 27 years you give me a mic and I'm a scream <laughs> but the Lord spoke to me this morning he says I'm giving you a specific word and I don't need you to scream I need you to teach now I want you to hear this because now that you know your life theologically I am rescued by the rescuer to go out and rescue what God has saved me for is far greater than what he saved me from God didn't save me because I was lost God really didn't even save me because I was broken God saved me but because God saved me for the simple fact that he wants to use me and he decided to use me before I ever sinned my first sin he decided to use me before I ever smoked my first joint he decided to use me before I ever drank my first drink and God hasn't changed his mind but I can't just live for the blessing without getting the burden so look what Nehemiah does God help me what 
what Nehemiah did we look at it like it's 52 days they did it so fast and we bypass what Nehemiah really did and in Nehemiah chapter 3 it says then Eliashab the high priest and the other priests started to rebuild at the sheep gate the fish gate the old city gate the dung gate the fountain gate above the horse gate the priests repaired the wall but here it is verse 28 each one repaired their section immediately across from his own house. God said, and he's saying to this church, you have a world vision, a global vision, A local vision but a neighborhood mission what people bypass about Nehemiah was he said you don't worry about her neighborhood build yours and then you build yours, 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 and then you go build yours, then you go build yours, and then you go build yours, and then you go build yours, and you build yours, and you build yours, you go build yours, don't worry about, don't worry about her neighborhood, you build your neighborhood, you build your neighborhood, you build your neighborhood, you build your neighborhood, and here's what happened. By the time it was done, you want to know why it was done so fast? Because he didn't tell them, go build the gates. He said, own your part, 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 own your part. Don't worry about her part. You own your part. Don't worry about her family. Own your family. Don't worry about your neighborhood. Don't worry about her neighborhood. Own your neighborhood. Because if you and every one of you own your neighborhood, you will rebuild San Bernardino like, like it has never been built before. I can't, I can't, I can't build San Bernardino. Because I don't own it. I own in Palm Desert. And the problem, and the reason why those gates went down, because the people of Israel, the people of Judah, didn't own their city. They allowed their city to own them. And their gates, their gates were burned. The walls came down. And if you know your life theologically, understand it providentially move in it purposefully you will own your part and your part will never own you come on you ought to give the Lord a clap off of that now
right, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to pray for people. Because there's people in here who's called to burn down, who's called to build some gates. And you are called to rebuild walls. But you can't rebuild what's broken in your life. And you can't repair if yours need it. Now, we're going to be specific because it could be all kinds of people. But I mean specific in this area. I'm going to come because I need a healing right now. I need it. Reliability. But Lord, as soon as I get prayed for, You've done your job. I now have to take responsibility. I'm not going to allow the enemy to come back and bring me back to this place that I'm at. Now here's where I've come to. There's some of you in this place that need to be rebooted. This has been happening too much. You're confused. You've been asking God, give me clarity. God, I'm, my mind is a war zone. And I need healing today. been rescued but I want to be a rescuer but I can't because my mind is confused if you're here today you say pastor that's me I need to be I want you to stand up on the count of three. One, two, three. Just stand up wherever you're at. Just stand up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stand up. 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 Here's what we're going to do. As, as these beautiful people come and sing, today. Come on, I'm reliable, but I'm also going to be responsible. I got myself in this mess. God's going to get me out. God's going to get me out. But I'm going to be responsible too. Now here's what we're going to do. And then I'm going to pass this on to your pastor and I'm going to pray for some of you. But here's what we're going to do. All of you that are out there, I want you to stand to your feet real quick and stretch your hands towards these people because they don't know it, but they're the Nehemiahs right now. God's going to use them incredibly. You're committing yourself to no longer living a life when you understand you've been born for this moment. There's a reason why the devil's worked overnight to attack you. Because he knows you've been born for such a time as this. 
you are going to be your best ever now. Lift those hands and say, Father, forgive me for living beneath your standard. I'm not average. I'm not even common. I'm extraordinary. And I'm born for this moment. I will not compromise. My gift, my assignment for such a time as this. Devil, take your hands off of me. I'm a child of God. I've been born for such a time as this. I'm never going back. Never, never, never in Jesus' name. Come on, now start giving him praise right now.